Stephen, okay. do you want to introduce yourself, or would you like me to introduce you? You, we could, you, wow, if you introduce me, that would be nice. And then wow. you introduce yourself. Wow, okay. Um, <laughs> I happen to have an introduction in my breast pocket right okay. here. Uh, this is my colleague, my esteemed colleague, Stephen Vitello, who is a, an internationally recognized sound artist and, mm. um, and colleague here at VCU who teaches in the kinetic imaging department. Mm -hmm. And I had the very good fortune of teaching a class with Stephen my very first semester here, which was about nine years ago. Wow. So we've mm -hmm. known each other for a little while. And this is it's great to be here with him. Thanks. And this is Hope Ginsberg, who I've known for exactly as long, although we found that we've overlapped um, for years before even that, who teaches in painting and printmaking as well as Art Foundation, whose practice is wonderfully curious, which is part of why I'm excited about doing this. That's that thing, yeah. Oh, that's um, nice. You know, yeah. I realized when I introduced you, I introduced you as a, a sound artist, and I wonder, do you object? Do you mm -hmm. prefer just artist and, and no modifier? No, I, for me, I have no trouble with sound artist. I had my gallery, my old gallery, didn't like that because it seemed less, it, I mean, they felt like one should call themselves an artist, and it's true, I'm an artist who works primarily with sound maybe from a marketing point of view, sound art suddenly devalues things, but from a truth or a clarity, I feel like I start to describe what I do and, and, and it just, it helps anchor things. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I went to um, Patient First once, I don't know if I told any of you guys this story, but I went to Patient First once and the doctor said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a sound artist. And I get nervous in these initial moments and I was like blushing and I'm just like waiting for him to take something out of my finger. And he said, I love sand art. My <laughs> wife collects sand art. And he went on and on. And he's like talking about the layering and the colors and the textures. And it all could be what I do, except you don't go to the, you know, I mean, I could go to the beach. Um, it's and like make the sand same, but yeah, no sand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there was that moment where I felt like I'm going to let him down, but I got to <laughs> break it to him. Yeah. I don't make sand art. I know. It's how much, <laughs> how much truth telling do we do yeah, with the people yeah. in our everyday lives who are yeah. not in the field? I don't know. But I, I did think, I mean, one thing that we could just quickly talk about is that, I mean, there's, I feel like there's a lot that Hope and I overlap on and then we're very, also very different. But it is that we both find ourselves primarily in the art world, but often exhibiting and doing residencies in non-traditional, spaces. We both do have some object making, but it's not really conventional object making and um, quite often. But what, I mean, when that like doctor at patient first asks you, what do you do? What do you say? Yeah, I, I, um, I say that I'm an artist. I mm -hmm. don't have a, I don't have as a, a one word before artist mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. So I sort of stick with art, but right. I think for me, probably the closest history mm. is performance. Mm -hmm. um, so I could say I work in performance art. Yeah, that helps. Um, yeah, actually what I do is I say, um, I'm an artist, mm. for example, yes. I made this project, right. dot, that, dot, dot, that helps. And, then yeah. I, and then I sort of tell a little story. Sometimes I say I'm an artist mm. and, a, and, a, and a teacher. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, I, I, my slide that's coming up is, I've done a lot of artist talks, and I seem to always start with the World Trade Center project, which in some ways I worry to almost typecast myself, but it is a thing where for me it was this transitional project where I went from being a musician who had done soundtracks for visual artists and choreographers for 10 years from like late 80s to late 90s to suddenly having a space of my own and at the beginning of the residency, it was a six month residency on the 91st floor of the World Trade Center. At the beginning, I would have said, I'm a musician. Oh, but I'm gonna be working with the sound of the city. And at the end of the six months, I was thinking of myself as an artist who did site specific projects. And so I, I, I almost always start with this piece just because I think when I also play a little bit of the sound, people feel like they can get it and they have some grounding in what I do. Um, I have this, it's actually a two minute medley <laughs> that I want to play you. Uh, it, it starts with the World Trade Center the morning after Hurricane Floyd peaked. And I never do medleys, but this was prepared for something two weeks ago. And uh, 
But then it goes into recordings I did in the Brazilian Amazon. There's a hummingbird. There is small, small, tiny, 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 tiny tree hoppers vibrating through the stem of a plant. Uh, maybe one or two other things, but it's two minutes if you listen. That's the hummingbird. High line. Rattlesnake in my cabin. Never heard the sound of a rattlesnake in my cabin. Yeah, it happily. was actually it was in a box, which was nice. Oh, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> Olivia, who was one of our students, she had just graduated, came and she <laughs> she was standing in the doorway taking pictures, but she really didn't want to come in. Um, and it was a big, big rattlesnake. But I did this residency at Mountain Lake Biological Station, that uh, is a fantastic place in the mountains in Pembroke, Virginia, and. The very first day I got there, they were so excited. They had just caught a rattlesnake and thought I'd want to record it. And so carried this box to me. And it happened two other times during the two weeks. So it's, it's a, but those are just, I mean, those are field recordings that have gone into various projects, <coughs> including the World Trade Center, but just to maybe ground you a little bit in the, the things I gather and listen to sometimes change, sometimes don't change. But it's, um, I guess I, I should click, yeah. Yeah, although I, I think John has to be our clicker. Like we pretend to click uh, and then he clicks for us. Um, Have we clicked? We've clicked and hopefully that leads into oh, your Oh, it does. Beautiful, well, I mean, I, beard. I think that um, I guess maybe a one, one tiny honeybee is not as menacing <laughs> as a rattlesnake. But, um, but no, not scary. To, to, this is also a piece that, um, that I like to mm. start with in my talk because it was mm. a kind of. Um, formative work and um, and a lot of work that I've made since kind of follows after um, this bearded lady bearded lady piece so this is um, this piece I worked on from about 97 to 2000 and um, I built up a tolerance to honeybees so that I could have a bee beard and worked with beekeepers in um, in Connecticut and upstate New York to do this and then I um, I packaged bearded lady honey, and um, and the piece, which if we if we click, um, took the form of a three minute video of the bee beard and jars of honey for sale at, in mm. the cafe at PS One, um, and so this was for the Greater New York show in two thousand, and I was pretty insistent that viewers um, or that the piece would be shown in the cafe because I wanted people to be able to have um, uh, an interaction with the piece that wasn't defined by kind of gallery behaviors or or protocol and um, so 
yeah, I think is an example mm. of a performance, but not a performance mm. that happens in front of an audience, and one that's, aside from being modeled after the bearded lady, um, a performance that's not especially theatrical, but is rather rooted in kind of everyday activity, <laughs> air quotes on this one, mm. um, uh, and, then, and then presented in a, in a different context from where it takes place. So it's also kind of site-directed mm. site and um, solving the problem of how these live projects reach viewers who aren't there while the projects are happening is something that's very interesting to me in my work. Um, so mm. I think that that's probably something that the two of us have mm. in common in some sense is that the work we make is, um, is ephemeral mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily in the gallery and yet we sure. want to reach a wider, um, a wider audience with the projects. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And would you, I mean, when I first met you, I, I could swear when I would mention your name, people would say, oh, wasn't that the person who did the B piece? Oh, right. So I feel like it was all, I mean, my World Trade Center piece has been a signature piece. I mean, do you feel like the B beard was a signature piece or I has think, been? I think for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I mean, it's a, when I, when the piece was on view, sometimes I would look over people's shoulders as they were watching mm. it. And, um, and I saw this little kid. I think that kids are a really good litmus test yeah. of artworks. Like, I think if there's a fascinated kid, you're onto something, you know? Um, mm. And the kid said, do you think she's like a real person or a circus person? <laughs> That's pretty and, good. Um, and I That's sort of good. loved hear, yeah. overhearing that. And, um, but I think that image is, is striking and the piece yeah, toured, me too. the piece toured quite a bit. So, um, so. Yeah, I think it's kind of a signature piece for sure. It's a thing, I mean, I've found with the art world, with my experience, but a lot of people too, that you may, there's certain projects you do that open doors. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, maybe after a certain period, it could come to frame you too much, like you're that person who does this. On the other hand, because you're the person who did that, you either get invited to do it again, or it gets to travel, or you get other opportunities. And so, for me, for example, with the World Trade Center, it's been this, it was, it was, Nam June Paik said I had a karmic debt to the World Trade Center when it was destroyed, which is a really hard thing to live with, but it was, even before the buildings were destroyed, it was something that opened possibilities. Suddenly I was being invited to make pieces for galleries, to have other residencies, uh, and, and so, you know, I'm, gr I'm grateful for many reasons for having done yeah. that project. And I, I know that's not, the piece that you put in the Greater New York show, but right. this is a this is an exhibition that Stephen and I were actually in together. Exactly. Um, a, a few years ago, and um, and yeah. I think that that's what that show was supposed to do in yeah. a way for people yeah. is to kind of make an introduction. It was. So, so let's go play. Um, this was my piece from Greater New York, and and for those of maybe some of you know this, but it was kind of I mean it's 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 been repeated I think twice since then. Um, but it really was a kind of career-making show for a lot of people. For me, it led to having a, a, a I, like I had this Stephen at Greater New York, I think we all did, um, email address. And I remember I got this email saying, Dear Stephen, you know, I run, I, like I got a lot of either fan mail, which I never, probably almost never get, but also got offered a gallery. And I didn't know it was a cool gallery or like an important gallery, but I was just like, huh. Um, but it was also, I was still sort of sliding my way into the art world in some ways. And um, with my piece, I mean, this was a group show with, I don't remember if it was 100 artists. I mean, it was so packed. And I was one of the very few artists in the whole show that had a room of my own. And the curator, Carolyn Christoph Barkarshiev, who's now one of the most important contemporary art curators, but she was really behind my having this room, which was also, um, Dan Graham had had this piece, which I loved. And so it became like the Dan Graham room. The head of PS1 told me I didn't deserve it. Only a painter deserved a room like that. And sound really could go anywhere, which I spent my whole career fighting. Um, we can keep it on that slide for a second. But I was so unbelievably glad I won that battle because it wasn't a piece that would have existed. There was a rotating speaker and it was a random chip that would move the sound directionally around the room. And then there were stationary speakers. And it was at the very end of the top floor. You'd get to it if you got to it. Most people would stick their heads in, go, hmm, nothing here. And then a few people would stay. And I, I have this like, a memory I'll never forget of there was this like, punk rock couple making out. There was a woman uh, nursing her baby. 
and there were these two geeky guys who just kept like trying to make the interactivity happen and there was no interactivity but they were sure that it was <laughs> but it it you know, it was very satisfying for me to have that room i needed the space the natural light was really nice and it was kind of a statement so even if five people stayed there i mean those five people stayed there an hour well other people had a thousand people move through in 30 seconds but i'm happy if i get the you know, the nursing mom, the punk rock couple, and the geeky guys. And like, that's, you know, I'm like, that's really fortunate. That's all I need. Okay, click. That's the poll quote. That's, yeah. Okay, back to Hope. Oh, is this back to me? Yeah. Okay, so, um, well, while I was working on that um, honeybee project, I was also working at a textile company in New York City. So that was my day job. And it was a textile company called Design Tex, and they made. Uh, commercial upholstery and other types of commercial fabrics and they designed a totally safely biodegradable commercial upholstery fabric and um, and I was tasked with my marketing department hat on to um, tell the story of this fabric and the more I read about this fabric that ha you know um, that had been engineered really to not have any endocrine disruptors or mutagens or formaldehyde or fish toxicity you know all of these things that are in commercial textiles that make it so toxic and so polluting not only at the end of its life but also in terms of the water that's used in manufacturing this project was just um, kind of revelatory and poetic and also safe to eat and so because i was really interested um, in this dynamic between our art life and our everyday life, I got especially jazzed about the fact that what I was seeing at my day job felt mm -hmm. like an artwork. And so for that very reason, and to ask questions about, well, what is, what is the corporate and, and how, do we, how do we receive it and, and what, what assumptions do we make about where we look for art? I wanted to present that company's project in, a, um, in an art environment to kind of pose those, those things. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you're looking at is a compost bin. So it's a circular display unit that That's was designed nice. for every stage of the fabric's life cycle from wool to yarn to woven yardage. And then on the opposite side, there are thousands of Icenia fetida redworms nibbling the fabric back into soil. And in the end, I packaged compost. And, um, and that piece sort of moved fluidly between art spaces mm -hmm. Um, like PS1 and Real Artways in Hartford, Connecticut, and the company showroom, mm -hmm. where I would wind up like putting my calls to voicemail and going out into the company showroom and doing artist talks to visiting classes of great. students. And so um, there were some thinkers and artists that I was really interested in at the time who were really trying to tease apart or shed some light on this dynamic between art and life and how those two things can or cannot integrate. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and this piece kind of emerged out of all of that thinking hmm. and my job. It's a good thing. And it was back at PS1. Got it. More insects at PS1. Worms yeah. this time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, click. Um, I don't know if there's a direct link to this, but it, I just had this thought, which was, so this is uh, an image from the Brazilian Amazon where I was, I mean, how things lead to the next thing is uh, maybe an interesting thing for people, but. I'd done the World Trade Center project. Paul Virilio, the theorist and urban um, thinker in France, asked to have that piece at the Cartier Foundation. But I was told they really wanted it in the show that they were doing. Paul Virilio was curating a show about the history of the accident. And they said, but you can't have a room of your own. You can't have surround sound. It can't be dark, something else. And like every condition I had for the sound playback of my World Trade Center recordings was a no, and I was like, hmm, this is a really big opportunity. Paul Virilio is very cool. F Cartier Foundation is fantastic, but I have to say no. They then said at the last minute, okay, they would commission a small piece that related to the show, and I made this uh, piece using photo cells, listening to light frequencies. Um, at the end, at the opening, they they said, oh, by the way, you're in our next show, and we want you to go to the Brazilian Amazon and do a piece about shamanism, and you'll be leaving, I think, in like seven weeks. And I just thought, wow, um, holy crap. So, so I, I suggested two other people, David Toop, who's a writer who had 
visited the Yanomami in the 70s and Chris Watson, who's one of the greatest field recordists in the world, and they said, no, we like working with you, we trust you, you're going. And so um, I didn't know a lot about field recording. I, I'd used contact mics on the windows of the World Trade Center, but that's not the same as going out into the open field, uh, being in a place where there's no electricity. But not many weeks later, I was on a little Cessna plane that would fit on this green screen stage. On a leaf stage, of this plant. A leaf of this plant that I brought back, no. Um, and dropped with an anthropologist into this Yanomami village where I was spent about eight or nine days, I, f I always forget, um, recording and gathering material, speaking to one particular shaman who talked to me about sound in the forest, something that I don't think had been documented about the way he would prescribe meaning to what he would hear. And it was, he would do that after taking an intense amount of hallucinogenics. Um, but the one thing that, uh, you know, when I tried to say, no, send somebody else, part of it I thought was, I'm not an expert. I don't know about ethnography. I don't know about field recording. And what I realized through doing that, that maybe it's different than the way hope works, is for me, it just became about landing in a place and having an experience. and. I've you know, performed at MoMA using glass bells that Alex Hayden, who's now in works for sculpture, built for me, and I had no idea how to play them. I tend to do things just almost scaring myself into what's going to happen in this instance, whereas I feel like for you, research, a different kind of research and, and long-term investigation is really critical to the work think, that you do. I mean, I, I, think, I think that's right. You I think that... I think that the term expert is really, um, mm -hmm. you know, that raises a lot of questions. Yeah, like I, so. I, I learned a lot about honeybees, but right. I wouldn't, I'm not an entomologist, you know, right. and I, I spent a very long time learning about sea sponges mm -hmm. to find asconoid specimens mm -hmm. are there before you in this installation mm -hmm. image. But I wouldn't in any way be considered an, an expert. True, and and so I, yeah. think, I think that there's something for me, um, in the work, which is so process-based, about learning, learning by doing, mm -hmm. and maybe to the same, um, you know, by the same token of just sort of scaring yourself into yeah, a circumstance. Yeah. For me, I think there's something about um, being in a situation, enabled, mm -hmm. um, enabling, paying attention, and I think that um, that the projects that I make are so immersive, whether it is. Um, you know, learning to scuba dive so that I can actually see the sponges that have been my muses for mm -hmm. a project, or befriending a community of beekeepers and, and, you know, taking the four train in the Bronx every weekend to go get a jar of mm -hmm. bees handed over the turnstile and, and visit my mm -hmm. friend Francis. You know, there's a real, like, um, mm -hmm. learning by doing factor to all of these projects. And, um, and that's really the best way for me to pay attention. Yeah. Um, so what you're looking at is actually an installation and you have to try to, having heard Stephen's sound mm. medley, you mm. have to kind of close your eyes and try yeah. to imagine a, a soundscape in that space um, mm. that Stephen made with also with his own field recordings, mm -hmm. right? And also field recordings from um, an oceanographer who was using um, sound to navigate in the deep sea and also Ann Krober, a film recordist. But anyway, mm. so... Big picture, last, um, that is an exhibition from uh, Solvent Space, which was an exhibition space in Richmond. It's from 2008. And, um, and it was the first iteration of an ongoing project called Sponge that took place in Richmond, Virginia. And, um, and Sponge was a teaching and learning project. It was a project about pedagogy. I worked on it for eight years. And the basic sort of premises of the project were scrambling um, hierarchies between experts and learners and also total flagrant bending and blending of disciplines. So a uh, sponge workshop, the mm -hmm. first sponge workshop was a five day workshop and it was um, the first day was a sort of deep dive into um, undersea life. The second day was about Mongolian craft the third mm. day was about art and industry. Mm. Um, and the fourth good. day, I think those are all the days, I think it was four days, um, was about utopia. And then everyone who participated in this um, 
absorbathon, as I called it, back in 2007 mm -hmm. when I made it, um, taught something back to the rest of the group. So it was all about knowledge transfer. And the sea sponges became, the more I learned about sea sponges, I realized they were the kind of perfect animal muse mm -hmm. for this project. So, um, yeah. So yeah. That, that, that installation at Solvent Space here in town kind of led to other installations and iterations of sponge, which mm -hmm. I guess we'll get to in our sure. slide program. Okay, next click. Hope mentioned that thing about pay attention and uh, one of my favorite videos in the world, we watched it in a grad seminar that some of you guys are here from, but there's a Bruce Nauman video, it's like two and a half minutes online, where he talks about someone who trained him to, to, someone who taught him to train horses, and the most important thing they said was to pay attention. And he bridges from there into the best art teachers he had who just taught him to pay attention. And I mean, for me as a teacher, I'll say that's, I feel like the most important thing I do in all of my teaching is say, pay attention, listen. Mm -hmm. Like it's so simple, but, and as an artist, that's what I'm trying to do is just make people, or not make, but encourage people to pay attention. And, and even with that medley that I played you, I mean, the thing about, especially when it's pure sound, is I find that people's experiences are so individual and there, if I, you know, if, if you just listen to those recordings and you close your eyes, especially if I let them go longer, uh, everybody listening to a water recording is probably having a different internal experience. And it's a thing that I really love about the way that emotions and sound work together. And it can happen with, with also with a visual, but it's just, there's something that sound can do to create an internal kind of creative awakening uh, mm -hmm. that, I've been reading that, I guess, with our, our sound pr is processed much more quickly than our eyes. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that we kind of, we see and we process intellectually and then maybe we emo have an emotional reaction. For me, at least, I listen and I have an emotional reaction and then maybe I get an intellectual yeah. uh, experience. I, I was just at a, um, at a, at a dinner where someone was talking about mm. work that they were doing with mm. children, mm. and one of the children's projects was about um, eating through their ears. Wow! And we That's all nice. like we all laughed as though that was you know it was yeah. kind of like wild, yeah. but yeah. it also seemed kind of funny. And then later that night, um, the person who was performing, who mm. was a musician, played played her work, and it was just so incredibly moving and touching. Mm. And it sort of felt like wow, mm. we do eat through our ears and sound yeah. has this way of sort of being so bodily and so mm. physically experienced. Mm. You kind of, it's sort of like eating through your ears or like walking through walls. Like yeah, you, your work is nice. in other people's bodies yeah, in a way. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, um, like, it, like it or not. <laughs> yeah, right. There's, uh, keep, if you keep the slide there for a second, no, or, or keep it there for a second. So this one, um, this was at Sculpture Center in 2004. I was installing it when I got a phone call asking me to move to Richmond, Virginia and teach at Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, it was a show that was curated by Regina Basho, who's one of my favorite and I think Hope's favorite curators. And we've had uh, someone who I really, who has an ongoing relationship with artists that she works with and I feel really fortunate to be among them. But with this piece, uh, also this idea of body, the sounds were so low frequency that you couldn't hear them with your ears, but you could feel them with your body and with your hands. I was very conscious that I was in this group show with all these other artists making sound works, and I didn't want to be competing for sound space. And there was also some, like there was a Joseph Boy's Silent Eraser. There was Steve Roden, one of my favorites, uh, uh, was in the basement with a very quiet piece that was these small speakers and broken wine bottles. I mean, there was sound everywhere and there was ideas of sound. But this one was very much a sound in relation to architecture. And Vito Akanchi came and gave me a kind of studio visit and also in some ways gave me permission. It was the first time I'd worked on this scale uh, and architecturally with physical objects, not just listening to architecture. and. My gallerist had told me that it was so like six years ago, but um, fortunately, Regine insisted that I do it. And fortunately, Vito gave me some good advice and, and uh, 
it, it led to a number of other variations. And the piece got acquired by the Museum of Modern Art about a year and a half ago, which is kind of thrilling because it means that they'll care for it. It's the speakers are ephemeral. The playback was, a, you know, was, was not a material that's going to last. So they're also now invested in caring for so it. So they'd be responsible for making it playable exactly. and transferring formats. Exactly. Ad infinitum. Yeah, hopefully. That's amazing. And and each and I mean that one was really sculpted to the space mm -hmm. that I was in. So there's also this question of that I don't know if it's resolved, but at least it's a beginning of if they install it, would I come in and and uh, supervise? Would I reshape it if I'm not alive where I'm in Ecuador? Um, you know, if like you <laughs> one, one of yeah, those things, that's always um, the thing. Um, once I was in El Salvador and people couldn't get to me for decisions and I've always sort of liked like that moment. But, um, but in any case, uh, there's this question of who has the right to shape it, uh, replace the speakers, replace the media. And, and I think that's a really important thing because everything that all of us in this room make are probably, the, you know, un well, it's, it's all timely and it's all going to fade depending on what you're working with, depending if it's electronic, how you care for your, your hard drives, how you migrate it, how you keep track of some format that may not even exist in three years. Uh, it's critical stuff to think about. I think. Okay, let's do, I think I have a couple clicks that are me. We'll yeah. go through. Um, just real quickly, what time is it? I mean, we'll, we'll keep clicking and discussing for a few minutes and then we'll go to questions. But this was just, um, just as other kinds of work I've done, this was a little book I made uh, that was at, I, the gallery I worked with at the time was called The Project and they had been in Harlem and then they moved to 57th Street. And this was, I had worked on a piece um, called Smallest of Wings for months and months and months. And at the last moment made this for like th $3 of materials. And um, suddenly it was the piece that was in Time Out New York. It was the piece that sold. <laughs> there was this thing that it was a unique object and people still get very confused about, like critically they're like, oh, we love that sound piece, but that book, we can, you know, we can hold it, we can put it on our shelf. So it was also a kind of stepping into commodity in a way that I kind of like, it still confuses me. When I first started my career, uh, two people gave me advice. One was stay away from making anything that's marketable. And that was someone who ran a kind of blue chip gallery. And then an artist, Tony Ausler, told me, no, that's not true. Make things that reflect your sound process and make money so you can have a studio. And um, I don't have a studio, but I have a lot of cats and, and a family. <laughs> but um, cats occasionally. Cats can be expensive. Yeah, I have a lot of expensive. cats too. There's it's another. True. It's true. Yeah. yeah, we'd have, exactly. Anyway, okay, one more, one more thing is me, I think. Um, this was a speaker drawing that was a, one of a number of drawings that I made. Uh, at the time, there was a second year grad student named Sal Becker who help, had come to Australia and helped me on a project I did with Julie Maratou. I wanted to do drawings, but I can't draw, and I wanted to figure out a way of process drawing, and Sal helped me figure out a way to use the vibrations of my speakers to create um, drawings and, and so I did this body of work and, and uh, using different inks and, and materials and just capturing like a moment of performance on paper and um, mm -hmm. so that, that's a speaker drawing. Okay. Traces. Yeah. It's a, okay. Okay. Now we go back to... to now we're back. Um, that's the sponge headquarters and um, that is a five-year long piece um, that has been cited at the Anderson Gallery here. So one of the um, sort of inspiring things about the very humble sea sponge, which until the late 18th century was mistaken for a plant, mm -hmm. is that it has the mm -hmm. distinction of being the only adult animal that doesn't move. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in um, sort of planting the sponge project here at VCU to, um, to see what it could incubate if students from many different departments mm -hmm. were working um, in collaboration with me to make projects. And so that space had um, a top bar beehive with bees flying in and out of the third floor of the building and a 90 gallon aquarium and a felt making studio. And we did projects that we took to MoMA and, mm. um, and the Mercosul Biennial in Brazil. And we also did projects here in mm -hmm. Richmond. Mm -hmm. um, and 
Yeah, there was something I wanted to say. I mean, I think that as I talk about it, this notion of collaboration, mm. particularly navigating all the collaborations that happen with the students in that space, that um, that's another kind of thread mm. Mm. between our our practices is is sort of sure. the hive the hive mentality of how mm. many people with whom we're in dialogue about mm. any project and then how many people are involved in the mm. making of many of the works. Sure. Um, so yeah, that's the, um, that bee yard was called The Bees Would Like to Know You and uh, mm. it's not so far from where we sit. Oh yeah, so we can click. And the next slide was from, this is an artifact from mm. the first semester long iteration of the Sponge Project, which was a class called Collab Lab Lab which was a collaborative lab about a lab for which I registered as a student at VCU. And my class and I took a um, biology lecture and lab together. So our class took a class. And when we showed that project at um, Flux Factory in Long Island City, we were awarded a trophy for being most empirically rebellious, wow. which made us very proud. Okay, so we can click. And, um, and this I can just speak really quickly about, oh, I have a few in the lineup. Yeah. So this was um, a workshop. So the sponge were um, many, the workshop model of the sponge kind of lived on and my students and I rolled up to New York City in a big van with many different prototype mm. casts of sea sponges in bronze and foam and beeswax. And we had a needle felting demo and the public was invited to needle felt into sponges. The piece mm. was called Prototype for Preserving the Phylum Periphera. Um, and if we had more time, mm. we could talk about the sponges over harvested fate and the, its capital, mm. but, um, but we'll keep moving. And there was also a honey tasting from the Sponge HQ Beehive and a video projection and other printed artifacts. Next. Sure. Um, so some of those same students and I went to the south of Brazil to hand dye and felt 40 pounds of wool from which we rendered four species of Brazilian sponge, two marine and two freshwater, which we showed in two submerged waterless tanks at a thermoelectric plant on the Guayuba Lagoon. Mm -hmm. And the sponges you're looking at were dyed with indigo and cochineal. Yes. And that cochineal dye Sorry. and insect is an apt segue to the slide that I can see is on deck. Okay. okay. <laughs> So I feel like this was my most sponge-worthy um, project, if, if you know the Seinfeld rep rep um, although that's sex too. But, um, but anyway, this was my most spongy project, which was, and my most, one of my most recent, uh, this past summer, I was back at Mountain Lake Biological Station. I went there two summers in a row and collaborated with a biologist named Dr. Casey Fowler Finn, who, listens to substrate borne vibrations and what she taught me was that 90 percent of the insect sounds we're not actually hearing and we hear you know katydids and whatever um, cicadas and these sounds but a whole lot of it is vibrating through stems of plants vibrating through earth vibrating on you know limbs of, of trees and she had given a talk there one night uh, to mostly biologists and a few artists, and I'd given a talk there about my work, and we both connected through listening. And, and I asked, I was asked to do a project at Virginia Tech in their cube space, which is five stories high, 144 channels of sound, which if you can imagine, you know, a normal room is stereo is two channels, or surround is six, or five plus a subwoofer, 144 discrete channels of sound. And rather than make a big, loud, fast moving piece, I ended up making a very, very, very quiet piece working with Casey, who's Dr. Fowler Finn, uh, and recording and listening to very quiet insects and making a piece that kind of lived in, in, in then in the cube at Virginia Tech and hopefully will happen again. Uh, she, I mean, she taught me a lot about listening to insects and what was happening, and I think I taught her about the ways I record, the way I compose, and, and I guess a point, just because we both brought up collaboration, to me a really critical thing with collaboration is always to establish one's terms. And so when I, I was asked to make this exhibition, then I went to this, this biologist and said, would you work with me, but just to be clear, Ultimately, I'm going to make a composition for a space with these sounds. I'll credit you, I'll acknowledge 
but for me, I see it as my work kind of in collaboration with you. But if you, being Casey, do a project in a science museum and want me to contribute, then I would be your support system. Is that okay? And she was very okay with it. And it's just, it's a thing that with every collaboration I've done, I try to, to learn the terms very cl clearly from the beginning. Is who has final say? Do we have final say together? Is someone getting paid? How is someone being credited? Are they being ha happy? And so uh, beyond just mentioning the, the work itself, just to put it out there that for me, collaboration has been the most enriching thing I've done in my career. It was my grad school. Like I didn't actually go to grad school. That's how I learned was through collaboration. But uh, the few times that it's gone badly, which is a few out of more than 100, it's just because I, something was not communicated. Mm -hmm. Somebody thought, oh, wait a or I thought, wait a second, I thought we made this together, or someone's suddenly telling me what to do, and it's not just like, here's an idea, and I'm thinking, I didn't understand this was the terms. Yeah. So if I, you know, if I know Hope is making a project, she's asked me to contribute a sound element, I kind of know where to balance my ego. If I know, oh, we're going to sit down and hash out ideas, and, and then we're going to come up with something that represents both of us, then I know, again, like ego, in a, I think not just a negative way, but like a, a practical, like where, yeah. where do I put my voice? Yeah, and I think it's about, <laughs> I think it's about sort of defining the terms mm -hmm. with the people with whom you're working, you and it's to. also sort of like literally about understanding the terms. And I would say that sure. the Sponge Project that I've been talking about definitely would sit nicely within the the field of contemporary art making known mm -hmm. as social practice. And mm -hmm. when you're working with other people in this form, understanding mm -hmm. who's in what role yeah, and when to even yeah. say the word collaboration is quite critical. And yeah. as I've come to understand it through mm. some of um, some of the readings I've done about social practice, and right now mm. I'm thinking of this great book called What We Made by Tom Finkelpearl. Mm -hmm. um, you know, collaboration is really when when two people put or or, or several, as many people as work on the project, put a work out and mm -hmm. you don't know where one person's work begins and the other ends. Sure. It can't really be teased apart. Mm -hmm. And when, and so I would say that some um, sponge projects, the students and I were really collaboratively coming up with mm -hmm. the idea. Mm -hmm. But in the projects where, let's say, I came up with the, you know, the sort of overarching idea and the students are kind of owning pieces of it. In that case, I would say it's really a, a more of a cooperative and a, and a better mm -hmm. word would be kind of cooperation mm -hmm. and that they're cooperators and not collaborators or that I would be in a situation where I was a cooperator and not a collaborator. And then if you mm -hmm. scale back even more, just to stay on terms mm -hmm. for another minute, you know, you could have participants and mm -hmm. just because the work has is live and people are, are, are working mm -hmm. with you to produce it, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a collaborator level of agency in mm -hmm. imagining what the piece is. Mm -hmm. And in that case, they're, they're um, participating in a work rather than collaborating. So I think that yes, yeah. sorting it out at, you know, right off the rip, For sure. and then also yeah. being precise with the language, which I was being kind of, mm. I don't know, a little loosey-goosey, yeah. but yeah. For sure, I think that's very important. You know, I mean, maybe like where you were saying you came up with the overarching idea, in some ways you could think of it like a project like that as like, like a jazz piece where you kind of came up with, this, you're the composer, but then you have these soloists and you give them room to do what they do. Oh, you know, it is your project, but then their name is in there because you never would have made it without that amazing saxophone solo, even if the saxophone solo is a... A, a wall mural. <laughs> I think that's right, and just yeah. also sharing credit. Yeah. Ex as, yeah. as you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. So that was our that was our um, yeah. our little lesson within a yeah. lesson. Yeah. I mean, I for me, I worked for the artist named Jim Paik for 12 years. If you want to click it too, please. Uh, and in very m different capacities, one of the things about working for Nam June or worth Nam June is he did. I wasn't really part of the studio team, but I would work with him in various ways. He would often credit me for things that I didn't work on and then for, and not credit me for things I did work on, but it was like a karmic balance and it was, uh, I didn't, again, I, I was okay and I, I trusted him, so it was all okay. Yeah, he was like a trickster collaborator. Yeah, he was a trickster. Um, just real quick, the piece up now is called Four Color Sound. It was at Diverse Works in Houston and then it toured. Uh, it was a piece I did with 
a collaborator, a lighting designer named Jeremy Choate, who was sadly uh, killed a couple years ago. But he was this fantastic young guy. He also worked with me on a building piece that I have at Mass Mocha, on a piece I had here at the Anderson Gallery, other things. But it was, for me, trying to find ways to engage with light as like a material that related to sound. I told Jeremy I wanted the light to be really physical and tactile. And he said, oh, I'll bring in a, a hazer, which was like a, created a fog in the space. And it really did make your hand feel like you could hold light. You can keep going. This is at Mass Mocha, which is uh, our other shared favorite curator of all time, Denise Markanish, invited me to, she brought me to this building, which had been the power state. It was where all the coal would gather, and then it would heat all the factory buildings that are Mass Mocha now. Uh, and she brought me there and said, if you could make a piece here, for example, would what would you know? Would you be interested? And in, you know those moments where you're like, like the little cartoon <laughs> dog that's flying off the ground. But I was trying to be really cool and be like, yeah, I could do something. Um, and it it took a while because it's. I don't know if anybody's been to this space. It's my piece has been up there now for five or six years. Um, you have. It's it's a wild space, and it's it's they preserved it. Uh, rather than take everything out, it's rusty. There's pipes, there's tubes, there's tanks. It's so gloriously beautiful. Um, but it took a while to get permissions, the state permissions, to make it a public space. And I, again, this word collaboration, but I, I invited a, an author who I didn't know named Paul Park, who was a sci-fi fantasy writer, to write a story for the building that I then used as a score and I had to make sure like I played him a version where almost all the language was gone but his language was becoming the fuel for which my sounds would happen and he was happy and I thought wow I've like I thought he'd be mad but then I ended up putting language back in so you hear voices you hear sounds that all come from the space uh, he published a novel I named the piece based on ideas from his language. He then published a novel with that name, and I'm in the novel, and the piece is in a novel. So there's also a flip-flopping that, that I'm super, super proud of. Uh, maybe one, one or two more quick ones. This was, you heard, um, earlier you heard a whole lot of bells in my medley, which was from my installation that was on the High Line uh, called A Bell for Every Minute. I recorded bells from all over New York, from religious cultures and sporting cultures and pets and anywhere I could find a bell and made a piece uh, out, of, out of that. This bell is at Herald Square. It, it's confusing how to represent what I do because this became the iconic image for that installation, but it's not the image, of the, it's not the installation, it's just a bell that I recorded, but it looked cooler than five speakers hanging on the roof of a, of a a pedestrian tunnel. Okay, so one more from me. So this is, I, I have a feeling with time, the last, both Hope and I have an experience with um, Robert Rauschenberg's residency space in Captiva, Florida. I was there in, I think it was 2013 or 2012, I forget. But I was fortunate enough to be- I think you were there in 13. 13? I okay. Think so. Okay, I'll take it. Um, it was the pilot year, the first year that they had this residency, and we were the inaugural group. I was there with six others. But it was a space that Rauschenberg bought up over time. He started going there in the 1960s, and until he died, uh, acquired this incredible amount of, of, of very special land on this island, Captiva, and had work space for himself, for collaborators to come, Merce Cunningham or Tricia Brown or Laurie Anderson or David Byrne, any number of people were known to have gone there and either done their own work or worked with him. And yeah, my, yeah. my bedroom was actually in a house called the Print House, and oh, it's because there was a print studio mm -hmm. outside of the door mm -hmm. of my bedroom where mm -hmm. Cy Twombly went to make prints. Snap. I mean, it's, um, you know, that place has yeah. got a lot of energy flying around, and yeah. a bobcat. Yeah, that's that true. apparently that's walked onto the property yeah. when you were the there? same. No, no. Um, but apparently the bobcat there. walked onto the property like the same week that Rauschenberg died, wow. and there's some there's a little bit of energy around that bobcat Gosh, too. Man, it was um, you would we 
you'd bicycle through this forest and we were told to have a, a flashlight. And there was a couple things not to do. Some, and one of them was like, you know, look, don't look for the bobcat. But I remember it was, yeah. But this, um, this chair, I, I made some pieces. I don't know if I made anything incredible, but I made, I had an amazing experience. But when I got there, uh, this wonderful guy who had worked for Rauschenberg for 20 years named Matt um, said, I can't really tell you where it is because it's really not meant for anybody to find except for the staff. But after Rauschenberg died, we took one of his chairs and ground it with six feet of concrete so it wouldn't be moved during a hurricane. And we put it in a place where he liked to sit. And after he died, uh, I think they said on the anniversary of his death, they would go and sit there and just listen and probably yeah. sit with just the view. And, but it was looking out to the water. And he said, if you find it, just go there and think of us. And so I went and I searched it out and I did some recordings sitting in that chair or standing by it because I almost felt nervous. And Maybe it's a cliche photo of a sunset, but it, it makes me feel good in terms of that memory of just finding it, hearing it, and feeling like I almost felt more, I felt more connected to the people who had known Rauschenberg. I felt like I couldn't make that claim to in any sense know him, but I felt really excited to be connected to the people who cared about him. And yeah. that was kind of a gift that Matt gave me in saying, seek this out and there's meaning for us from that place. And the sound recordings I made of the water maybe f would be generic water recordings for most of us, but at least for me there's a, 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 a connection to a time and a place and feeling very, like, there's moments as artists, it's, you know, it's really difficult and there's moments where you're really fortunate. Yeah. And that was one of those fortunate moments. Yeah, that definitely felt like a mm. gift. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to click? Yeah, maybe we'll click. Um, so that room where I'm sitting with a group of people in meditation with scuba gear, um, that is actually in Rauschenberg's first studio on Captiva. Mm. So that's that beach and that chair is maybe not so far from that room yeah. where we're sitting. But um, I, I went to that residency thinking that I wanted to make a video that kind of addressed and reenacted a car accident that I had had. Um, uh, a few years before and um, learning to scuba dive so that I could see sponges was one of the first times I realized that I was kind of physically recovered from the injuries that I had. And, um, and scuba diving itself is really kind of an incredible meditation because mm. every breath that you take, you're mm. so aware of it because you're, you know, you could be 60 feet underwater and you're aware that there's a system delivering you air to breathe mm. and you hear it, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. and so it really um, puts you in mind of your breath. So um, though I had intended to make a video that had something to do with the reenactment, something also kind of formed constellation or kind of mapped together for me around breathing and healing and, um, and diving. And so for this piece that I was interested in making, um, I wanted a scene where a group of people were either meditating or mm. doing yoga on land with scuba gear. And there's something very absurd about it. I mean, it's kind of um, a, bit, a bit survivalist. And yet it turned out to be quite an effective meditation mm. for all of the reasons of mm. the amplification of the breathing, the awareness, of the breath, the attention mm -hmm. um, to the space around you and the kind of constraints of the gear. So even though it was developed to be a scene in a video, ultimately I was with a room full of people leading a workshop that was a kind of introduction to meditation and an introduction to scuba gear. And I was like, you know, though working backwards from an image, I was right back in the space where I so often make my work. And so I got there in a slightly different way and yeah we can advance so so in terms of attention paid mm. those meditations in the gear really give you such awareness of the environment that you're in mm. and so I wanted to do one of these land dives after the breathing on land project kind of emerged as a fully formed thought from that video shoot um, in a desert in secrete Qatar and um, so that mm. is an image taken um, outside of Doha, meditating in a desert that is actually threatened by the 
um, by the rising waters of the Arabian Gulf. And Crazy. so the fact that there's a kind of harbinger of a future ocean in mm -hmm. that image mm -hmm. really put me in mind of thinking about doing these land dives in That's places so cool. where something about the environment and the change in climate is conjured. So the last piece um, that I pulled slides to show you is called Land Dive Team Bay of Fundy. And I was really interested in doing one of these scuba meditations mm -hmm. at a site where the water would literally rise on the bodies of the breathers until they were gone. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so the place to do this turned out to be this bay that's off the coast of um, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Maine called the Bay of Fundy, which has a tide that at its head at the Minas Basin goes up and down 50 feet twice a day. And so I sat in the very cold water of the Bay of Fundy in late October with three other meditating mm. scuba divers. And the tide mm. came in with the kind of fits and starts of the waves that day and just rose on our bodies until we were totally submerged. And it was a meditation that lasted about an hour and a half. And, mm. um, and it's a video. And it's a video mm. that nobody's seen yet because it just got done. The video is seven minutes long, but I have a two minute excerpt. And I just wanna say mm. that um, the camera people, so Jessica Carey, who is a uh, senior in the photo film department here at BCU, mm. Matt Flowers, who's an artist and alum that Stephen and I have both worked with, and, um, and Joshua Quarles um, did the audio and we contacted mm. Stephen for advice about a hydrophone and yeah. that's what he used and that's what you'll hear in the score. Cool, and then we'll go to questions, right? I Probably guess so. Yeah, that was nice. Thanks. Yeah. You So to find out what happens, you have to watch the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Wow. I feel like I mean, there's always more, but that's probably that's probably a good amount. If 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 you guys had questions, I don't know how it's mediated or moderated, or if we just look to you and then you look to us. But uh, we're happy to talk more, or 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 not. Oh, is it looping? Maybe so. Oh. Or we could we could all meditate. Too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, do people have <coughs> questions? I have questions, but you have questions too. Thank you for your attention yeah, yeah, to yeah, that. That's a lot of. I know it's a lot of stuff. Talking. For us. 
Well, I, I will yeah. start with a okay. question. Uh, so I'm, I'm very interested in your practices, and especially in collaboration. And one of the things that I think about with collaboration is not only that there's this collective authorship of the thing, mm -hmm. but also that, that you don't know what the thing is. Right, so you may have an idea as a collaborator of what you may want, mm -hmm. but the end product, especially in collaboration, becomes this kind of hybrid that is mm -hmm. that is not what you expected it to be, regardless of your expectations. So, is that another way of thinking about collaboration? Is the end product is not quite at your grasp? Or I, yeah, yeah, for, yeah. I mean, I would say for me, everything works that way. Um, I was thinking when I, I interviewed Ryuichi Sakamoto, who's one of the great contemporary musicians in the world, but, uh, about collaboration for the Smithsonian's website, and I asked him about a collaborator. He said, "Well, I would just never choose someone who can do what I do." And so, part of a collaboration is almost creatively picking the other person with some sense of where that may go. But ideally, anything that I do, I want discovery and. Uh, through whether collaboration, whether it's a concert and it's a duo, whether it's working on a project together. But I mean, one of the problems I find with the art world, and you guys probably find this with academia too, is people say, what are you gonna do? And then you think, oh, I haven't done it, but this is what I'm gonna do. And then you find other discoveries along the way and it gets ideally better. And sometimes you work with someone who wants to keep you to that original proposal, but I want enough of a sense of where we may be going, but also enough freedom to have the pleasure of discovering something I never would have dreamed of. And, and working with another person really does, get, that's one of the factors that, that if it's a good person uh, and you're listening to each other, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a joy is when you go where you didn't expect and it's a good place. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think I think some of the most exciting mm. pieces are pieces that in the end you feel like the piece kind of made itself or that yeah. it was an inevitability in hindsight. And one way I think to get to that experience yeah. is through collaboration yeah, where yeah, you just, yeah. you are at the outset not sure. And then to move, uh, you know, beyond people even into mm -hmm. an interspecial dimension mm -hmm. yeah, like uh, the bee beard was collaborating with these honeybees in a way that we didn't know what we we're going mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. and this Bay of Fundy piece which um, you know was two days in a van with two two days on the ground and two days back not not knowing what we were going to get sure. we felt like we were kind of collaborating with the tide and so Collaboration gives you those X factors, mm -hmm. but as, as John Cage says, you know, leave room for the X factor. Mm -hmm. I think any time you can build some not knowing into the process, um, it's good. Yeah. And I will say, as much as we're making collaboration into this very beautiful sun, sunset into the stars, um, <laughs> you know, it's not always, and there's times I wish I hadn't collaborated secretly where I think, God, I should have just done what was in my head with that person rather than communicating that. Or sometimes I used to have a, a kind of duo with my friend Molly Berg and we could really, we did better if we just didn't say a word to each other and started playing. But there was someone that we really admired. I remember bringing him in to ask if he would play on a record of ours. And he, we could tell he just felt totally shut out of the equation. And we were just like, what? We're, can't you think with us? <laughs> so you, you, know, you don't always find that person who either gets in your head or you can get into their head. Uh, sometimes you do have the secret expectation. So it, it can fail, but fail, you know, fail is, is also good. Yeah, I mean, I would just totally agree that it's, yeah. not, for, it's not for every project and, right. it, and it doesn't often, it doesn't always yeah, work yeah, out. Right. And I think that even when you have people who are not necessarily collaborators, but mm. you know, work for hire or other ways in mm. which you're working with other people, um, you can either get the X factor or the disaster. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hey. I have a How do you make these really like formalist decisions with your mm. installations, like um, the speakers mm. being arranged, or like the, the table that you have the honey on? Very oh. obsessively, yeah, in my yeah. case. Yeah. 
And for me, it's, it's I mean, it's intuitive, but I guess probably most of what we do is intuitive, but it's just going in there and, and looking and feeling and sensing. And, and the issue for me of the speakers in the space is always a kind of question and sometimes a frustration. Like the suspended speakers in that piece I showed you from Sculpture Center, they are sculptural and it was very meant to be visual. But a lot of times the speakers are in my room and I wish they weren't because everybody's, you know, that's where they're gonna sound best is if they're only five feet from the audience and they're about at your height. But people sit and stare at them like they're a thing. And they're not, and they're really, and they're a distraction. They're just a, a consumer utility. And so I, it, it's a point of, of question that I'm always questioning myself and kind of critiquing myself after the fact is where does the technology go? What do people pay attention to? And, um, but it really is like the site visit when you get asked to do a show. I've flown to Germany for a 20 minute meeting just to kind of go, up, down, okay, I get it. But it's just something also you get to the space and you figure out what are my possibilities. An idea comes, hopefully. And then, you know, there's also some moving around and yeah. ideally planning enough time during the install to say, I thought everything would go here, but it sounds better here, or it sounds good here, but it looks terrible. So what's, what's the give and take? And, um, Sometimes I've got a curator or a friend giving me advice, ideally, and ultimately I hope, like, oh, I have the final word and I have the final, you know, feeling of, okay, this is what I wanted, but I also am open and, and very happy to learn from others and, and get input. But it's, it's just with that question of the technology, it's tricky with design of a space. Uh, it also depends on what the content is, you know. Yeah, and I would just add to obsessively slowly, mm. you know, and yeah, I mean, yeah. to say that things move around, you know, like those tiny pink sponges, I can't tell you how many times I made micro movements to each little one mm. until, mm. and you just do it until you, your stomach ache goes away. I don't yeah, know. And yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and I also love doing it. I mean, yeah. that's one of my favorite, like, um, color, space, material. I've mm. tried to really hold on to all of those things in mm. my work. Yeah. Sure. Maybe that tension between sound art and music and mm. is that a term you prefer most in art projects mm. where you kind of don't feel like you can use that term? Uh, it's a really good question. And sometimes, you know, that term like composer I, I've always felt a little anxious about it. Same like I've felt about curator, even though I've curated shows. I've felt presumptuous to take that on. On the other hand, I think of composing as a kind of construction. And so I do know that I'm composing, I'm taking sound elements and I'm putting them together. And I've, some projects I edit very, very, very carefully or I perform. But in terms of an authorship, I do think that there's always an element of composition. I think, you know, whether that's the, the dominant thing I leave thinking about, I don't know. I think I compose partially, I compose spatially. So not just linearly in time, but I'm also composing for a space with 12 speakers, 15 speakers. But I, I think I can't sh get rid of art language or music language, but I just sometimes feel like I don't want to only go one way or the other, but I, I definitely, all of that informs what I do. And I do know that I'm, I'm you know, like I would watch someone like Jim Cohen edit film, and that taught me a lot about how to edit sounds and that assembly of how he's editing film footage is very close to the way that I learned to edit, edit my sounds and, and ultimately, you know, leave with something that's nine minutes and 17 seconds as a beginning, middle and end in, in the case of something that let's say goes on a CD. And it would be hard to say it wasn't composed. But it's, an, it's like a tension maybe that I keep in mind. Yeah. Could be good. <laughs> 